July the 18th, uh, and this is one of the uh, Wednesday webinars for the Go GN. So for those of you who might be watching the recording and don't know about Go GN, so Go GN is the global OER graduate network. So what we have is um, a group of PhD researchers around the world who are doing the their research on an aspect of open education and uh, we have students at the, the core of the network but around the students we have like a much bigger um, you know amount of, of people who are friends experts on open educational resources so we mix once a month um, as one of these webinars where we get uh, one of the Gojian researchers or an expert of both things because Gojian researchers are experts uh, to you know, get to present and share their, their work with us. So today uh, we have with us, and I think we, I mean, I'm always very happy to, to actually welcome everyone, but today uh, we have with us uh, Bernard and Kuyubatsi, and I'm not sure I can pronounce your name properly, so I'm sorry <laughs> for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, Bernard is joining us from, from Rwanda, and he was I mean, I know I know Bernard for for a few years now. He was uh, um, I met him first when he was first studying with for his PhD um, when he was at the University of Leicester, and he's he's been a um, he's he's now one of the coach and alumni, and he's done great work. Um, he's doing great work on open, you know, like sharing open educational practices, like promoting open educational practices in in Rwanda and by extension. The, the, the whole of Africa. So I'm going to leave you with him. Um, uh, Bernard will take questions at, at the end of his, of, of his presentations, but, 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 but what I'll do is try and keep an eye on the chat as well. So if any, um, you know, if, if you have any comments as, as, as we go along, I'll try and pick them up, but we will we'll, we'll wait to answer questions as, at, at the end. Um, so that's it. Bernard, they're all yours. Okay, thank you, Bea, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to this session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize because I have some cold, so that means my voice may be not good sometimes, so uh, please bear with me. So, um, I started with Go the Goji and the first uh, Goji seminar, which, which is the founding seminar that took place. In Cape Town, that was back in 2013, and uh, uh, I met there with uh, brilliant people, including Gino, Igor, and many others. And then, then we, I became a member of the Goji from then on. So, um, as as Bea said, I, I did my a, a PhD at the University of Leicester, and uh, my PhD thesis, thesis was on opening up higher education in Rwanda, with a particular focus on the potential contribution of uh, uh, extension MOOCs, the uh, open educational resources, and the different stakeholders. So, my PhD study had uh, different agendas, including raising awareness and the uh, triggering open educational practices and the influencing policies, uh, especially national policies. So, in this presentation, I talk about open distance and e learning policy development and the uh, uh, open educational uh, practices that follow. Um, so, as we all know, it's back in 2011 that we started seeing platform-based MOOCs. And that's when we started seeing different MOOC platforms emerging, including Udacity, Coursera, uh, Index, FutureLearn. Uh, Canvas has probably started in earlier, 2008, but it, came, uh, it became familiar to people around 2011 when uh, other MOOC platforms uh, started and then 2013 we have opened up ED, which is a MOOC portal, uh, not a MOOC platform, because courses on this portal are hosted at in, uh, different platforms at the offering in the universities. So uh, this raised awareness uh, in the different uh, countries of the potential of these open courses in the opening up education, but also in the, uh, in the capacity building. Um, and different uh, countries and governments and institutions responded. Uh, in Rwanda, for instance, there are uh, different policies that were developed, including the national open distance and e-learning policy, uh, which was developed in 2016, the national ICN education policy, 
which also kind of mentioned uh, the use of MOOCs and OER and OER in, in general. Um, and, it, and the current, there's a, a, a national framework for massive open courses and open educational resources that is being uh, developed uh, with the support of UNESCO uh, within the framework of um, UNESCO Korean Funding Trust project, uh, known as the ICT Transforming Education in Africa. And in the light of the national policy, the national ODA policy, the University of Rwanda uh, developed its institutional ODA policy. Um, and then later on, uh, an ODA policy implementation strategy plan was developed uh, within the same uh, UNESCO framework, the uh, ICT Transforming Education in Africa project. And the, 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 the ODA policy implementation strategic plan has two main strategic uh, goals, uh, which, which are uh, develop a sustainable ODA system at the University of Rwanda, which is, by the way, the only public education institution in Rwanda for the time being. So, and, and there are three objective, objectives which are establishing an ODA academic system that underpin the provision of relevant, equitable, flexible, and affordable high quality education established. The second one being established an ODA learner support system that will respond to the needs of diverse learners. And the third one being set up an ODA management system uh, that will, uh, will coordinate and lead ODA practices and the initiatives. So the second strategic goal is to set up enabling infrastructure uh, that will underpin a sustainable ODA system, uh, which has two strategic objectives. The first one is being set up physical and ICT infrastructure uh, and facilitates to enable and facilities to enable ODA development and delivery. And the second one being deliver and develop ODA capacity among the University of Rwanda staff and learners. So uh, there's also a methodology for ODA capacity building uh, for the University of Rwanda staff, which was developed in the light of the University of Rwanda's institutional ODA policy and the, its implementation strategic plan. Uh, and according to this methodology, uh, ODA capacity will be developed through different pathways, including scholarship and fellowship from different organizations. Uh, OER and MOOC participation, research and development, uh, open access publishing, uh, short courses in that focus on um, e-learning capacity building or ODA capacity building, uh, workshops, conference attendance and presentations, professional development, uh, professional association and networks, and you uh, are postgraduate, uh, the University of Rwanda's postgraduate and PhD program uh, with uh, ODA specialization. And different institutions responded to uh, this development policy, uh, ODA policy enabling environment. Uh, Rwanda Education Body, for instance, so, uh, which uh, required uh, recent organization and institutions involved in the teacher capacity building to consider uh, including the components uh, enhanced by uh, technologies. And the one education board is implementing the agents of the Ministry of Education. Uh, it kind of manages all teachers, all in service teachers for primary and secondary education. And also uh, the Flemish Association for Development, Cooperation and Technical Assistance, Vivo Bay Education Development, um, had already started uh, enhancing its courses in technologies. From last year, and up to now, uh, practice which is ongoing. Uh, VVOB, uh, with the uh, funding from Mastercard Foundation, is a uh, have you know kind of is is, is developing its courses. It used to provide to in service teachers into a blended learning mode. Uh, these courses are hosted on the University of Rwanda system, which is Moodle. Uh, but because Rwanda Education Board also expressed interest in hosting the these courses in the Moodle platform. Uh, we will be thinking about uh, releasing these courses and an open license so that it can be hosted on both uh, platforms. Um, these are courses that will be uh, redeveloping, is it developing in the blended learning mode? 
uh, there are four modules in the effective school leadership program, uh, two modules in the education and mentoring and coaching program, in the education and mentoring and coaching for STEM teachers. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, online learning or blended learning is relatively new in Rwanda. Uh, there will be all sorts of uh, kind of developing preparatory courses um, yeah, addressed to trainees, uh, trainees who are teachers, school based mentors, uh, directors of studies, and the and head teachers. And there's also a, a course for the ICT school leadership, um, which was developed in collaboration with, with UNESCO. And the, then there's a course addressed to uh, different trainers who, who are mainly at the University of Rwanda staff who are employed by the as trainers. Uh, the course is called e tutoring for the time being. Uh, as I said, uh, VWOB is, is really planning and it's still, we are still negotiating to, to make sure all those courses, uh, when they are available, they are released under an open license for, uh, for wider dissemination of uh, ODA capacity building in Rwanda. <coughs> So, um, I'll like to talk about this digital literacy for online courses, which is a course we will be developing as a preparatory course uh, intended to, uh, to prepare different trainees for blended learning uh, and especially the online component of blended learning. This course is being developed by mashing up uh, three different courses. Uh, the first one being one ICT Essentials for Teachers, which was adapted from the UNESCO's ICT competency framework for teachers, and it's hosted on the One Education Board uh, Learning Management Systems uh, system, and the and two courses from the UK Open Universities that are hosted on the uh, Open Learning Platform. Those courses are the uh, digital literacy. It's succeeding in the digital world, and the second one is the Am I ready to be a distance learner? And these courses are uh, well listed on the Open Up e portal. Uh, uh, as I said, the Open Up e portal was created in 2013, and it's unique in that it promote more openness. And by openness, they mean uh, access to the content free of charge, but also open license, which enable uh, open license, which enables uh, the, the reuse, the revision, and the redistribution of the content. So Open Up ED has been advocating the Creative Commons attribution and Creative Commons attribution share alike the content listed on the on its board. And um, uh, also Open Up Education uh, advocates for open to learners, which, which covers full course experience free of charge, open entry policy, open accessibility, uh, learning anywhere, uh, online, Starting learning anytime, uh, which refers to the self learning mode, and open programming, which, which uh, relates to uh, the freedom uh, learners have to choose which course to start for, from and which one to uh, follow. And then there's this course, e tutoring, which is uh, being adapted, developed uh, by adapting it from. From by adopting supporting ODL learners, which is, which is a Euclid University course, which was also released under creative attribution share alike. And uh, we're releasing these courses, uh, this course under uh, a, a Creative Commons license, kind of position uh, or reinforce Euclid universities, uh, non profit universities uh, status. Uh, so, for those who may not know, Euclid University, it's uh, a university that was started under uh, UN Treaty Series, uh, 49006 and 49007. So it's a sort of intergovernmental university. Uh, any member state can uh, be a participating uh, member in the Euclid University system. And so these are those courses which are being adapted. Uh, you can see uh, these derivative courses uh, that uh, are created from them. You can see the interesting course, uh, which is released at a creative, which will be released at a creative course, attribution share alike. So uh, it is targeting, it will be targeting the University of Rwanda staff, and it was adapted from the Euclid University's course supporting ODL learners, which was also uh, released at a creative course, attribution share alike. 
There's also the digital interest for online learning, uh, which will be released and create attribution, non-commercial share alike, which will be targeting secondary school teachers, school-based mentors, directors of studies, and the, and the head teachers. And it has developed um, by uh, kind of bashing up uh, courses from the One Education Board, which is uh, IST Essentials for Teachers, which was the reason a creative commons distribution share alike. And in the UK Open Universities courses, a minority for to be a distance learner and the digital interest for online learning, both are released under creative commons distribution, uh, non commercial share alike. So here are other courses from the UK Open University uh, Open Learning Platform that may also contribute to learning capacity building uh, in Rwanda and uh, anywhere else. Uh, there are two courses. Actually, these courses are not only from the UK Open University. These are courses from the Open ID portal. There are two courses from the uh, University of Turkey. Uh, that, those are digital transformation in higher education and learning and teaching in higher education in the digital age. There is one course from Aspasco University, uh, which is technology enabled learning, a massive open on course. Um, eight courses. Uh, no, six additional courses from the UK Open Universities, a university which are access accessibility of e-learning, assistive technologies, and online learning. Go uh, digital the digital scholar, an introduction to open educational resources and the open education. So, um, in that share, I would say that MOOC platforms raise awareness of the potential of the resources and courses. Uh, online courses and uh, in, in, in online or in the staff capacity building, especially e learning capacity building. And that's why many institutions uh, responded. And this, uh, this awareness was mainly raised by different platform uh, and, and different pro uh, portals which were created between 2011 and 2015. And of course, in Rwanda, particularly, national. Uh, Policies were developed, including the national ICT education policy and the ODA policy, uh, the, the national ODA policy. And all those policies uh, highlight the use of online learning and the open educational resources and massive open courses in the capacity building in Rwanda. And in the light of the national policy, uh, policies, institutional ODA policy, uh, policies and the implementation strategic plan were developed. And the University of Rwanda Institutional ODA Policy informed the methodology for ODA capacity building. And the national framework for OER and MOOCs is the under development. And different development partners and institutions in Rwanda are responding uh, by uh, adopting different open educational practices, and by adopting open courses, and raising probably uh, kind of uh, discussing on raising their courses. In open license. So, uh, particularly to the uh, they are uh, preparatory courses uh, that are uh, developed, to, uh, that are built uh, by the ad adapting different courses from the UK Open University and the uh, UK University, as well as One Education Board. And the, those courses are intended to uh, prepare people, different people, trainees and trainers uh, for online learning, uh, for learning in online. Uh, environment or facilitating or supporting online learning. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, your attention. If you have questions, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Bernard. Um, there's, a, there's a very interesting question there from, from Jenny. If, I don't know if you can read it. It says, I'm curious how much support and help you have in Rwanda for adapting the courses and leading blended learning on these topics. How is it going in terms of colleagues that can help? Because this is like a big task and many hands are needed. Um, it, is, it is true. How, 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 how are you coping? <laughs> so um, for the time being, that's, that's the organization that is mainly involved. We have a non learning team, which consists of who, three people. For the time being, we are actually two, and we are hiring a third one. So we'll be three people in the e-learning and uh, the online learning team at UOB. But 
as an organization is as well and learning from these practices we have what we call the ICT education working group um, it's bringing together all institutional development partners who are using ICT education so we share all these practices and the uh, other development partners have started thinking about using enhancing guys to with their training courses. And of course, there's the University of Rwanda, which is planning to develop uh, different uh, open distance and e-learning courses. Uh, but I would say it hasn't started yet for the time being. But that's the plan, that's why they developed uh, the implementation strategic plan. So, um, is it to be a lot of work? Uh, well, yeah, it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, for the time being, we are busy with preparing the course, and we will probably start around September with the blended learning course, the courses which we will be used to provide to different teachers, uh, which will be developing in a blended learning mode. But we, we are positive, we really uh, will go by, we will, uh, how to say, we will manage. Uh, So, any other questions? Yeah. Or did I answer the question well? There's, there's two very interesting. I don't know if I. Yeah. So, if you see, uh, yeah. we can go to we can go to Vivian's first if it doesn't go too fast. Um, yeah. She's also wondering about how uh, Vivian is, is wondering about how teachers are reacting to these policies. So, in in a way. Um, I mean, I understand that you, these courses haven't been implemented yet. Am I right? But do you have an idea of, of um, you know, um, what is the continuous professional development? And, you know, how how is this going to be embedded in in, in the practice? That, coming from Vivian, and then we move on to Deborah's question. So, um, sorry, I, I didn't clarification. Does Vivian mean? Secondary school teachers. Um, if those are secondary school teachers, I don't think they know about the policies uh, of their part. So what they know is that we inform that we are redeveloping those courses for uh, blended learning. We should be involved in online learning. And what we did was conducting a needs assessment, which was conducted uh, via a kind of self-completion survey asking them um, about their preparedness, different competencies, if they can perform different activities, um, uh, either basically ICT activities, ICT literacy activities, or even digital literacy, including, uh, like for example, finding information online and uh, evaluating the credibility of the information source. So then we also developed a test uh, to cross-check uh, to cross check if what they say they know is actually what they can do. We found we found a huge imbalance, but as we were going through uh, the, uh, the test, because it was developed in the learning management system, uh, Moodle, which will be used in all sorts of Europe uh, courses. So um, they seem to be excited about this new way of learning, and they could move quickly, uh, move uh, across pages. And what was exciting to them is how they could uh, then answer some questions and then when they submit they see read right away so that was something new for them and there are some comments one of them saying uh, you know you, should, you do things differently for others and he gave an example of how he was doing a distance learning program in the west african university and he had to pay some money travel to send the work and he had to pay some money but I was saying, if, if they were using this system, I would upload my work myself, and I wouldn't pay any fees. So, so they are still excited because it's something new for them. Maybe we have to see if that excitement continues if they, they start learning online. And do, so, how do you know how you're gonna do that? How do you? So how are you going to measure? No, that's too complicated. Uh, let's go to challenges. So uh, Vivian was also, so what mm -hmm. is it you find the most difficult in that sense? Uh, sorry, sorry. Can, can you come again? Can you clarify what? Uh, can you clarify that? No, I'm just speaking on on, on uh, uh, Vivian's um, second question, mm -hmm. as in 
can you know, your teams are very enthusiastic. But so, what do you think are the challenges? Uh, so, what's what's the the most difficult barrier that you that you're gonna face? So one one of the barriers was really uh, how fast they can type uh, using the computer. So um, being half prepared, uh, the test, I uh, think maybe it will last about uh, 35, 45 minutes to one hour. But uh, it went up to three hours, and they couldn't finish uh, you know, completing the test. Uh, but maybe if we put uh, the courses online and they learn in a, in a asynchronous way, uh, maybe we don't know, maybe they may invest more time in it. Uh, but also we are uh, preparing the course on ICT. It's actually the, the course on digital trust for uh, online learning, which we have also uh, the ICT basic trust. So that's one of the major uh, challenge. Uh, the other challenge was their computers were not maintained and they were very, very slow. Uh, but that, this may not be a big challenge as people are also planning to provide computers to schools where trainees uh, will be uh, participating in different courses. Okay, we'll let you catch your breath, but there's a very good question uh, from Deborah, and she's wondering about the adaptation of the courses. So she says, I was wondering about the adaptation of the courses, but also on how these courses are being embedded into practice, especially at the leadership level. Okay. Uh, how the blended learning course are embedded. So for the time being, the blended learning courses are not developed yet. So they have to be developed, as I said, starting from um, September. Uh, but the way they will be uh, kind of, uh, they will be monitoring. We are also developing what we call e-monitoring using tablets and Cobalt Toolbox, which is an open source online. So, and, and also that's, that's part of what we use. To, uh, that's what we use for the survey I mentioned. As I said in the, this assessment, we use a survey which was on tablets using Cobalt Toolbox and the, and, and the and a test which was run on Moodle. So uh, we will be develop, developing a different uh, survey to check how they are using them. Um, well, and then they will be submitting those, uh, you know, their, uh, their answers using tablets and then we'll be collecting them in the, uh, in the uh, I say, Kobo uh, online environment. Because it will be the account will be created by Vivobe and those uh, questions will be uh, created by Vivobe. As they submit their answers, we will be able to see the data uh, in terms of analytics. So, uh, uh, in other way, Vivobe will be following up on how they apply what they have learned in those courses. Um, uh, Vivobe also is planning to develop a professional learning community. Uh, professional learning network uh, uh, and the participation in the professional learning network may also be uh, kind of used to evaluate how they are uh, yeah, they apply what they learn in the, in the, in the uh, effective school leadership uh, you know how, how they apply it in that community um, so uh, did I answer the question you did, but I'm still curious. So, see, for instance, like more in terms of um, so when you selected one of these courses, whether it was the Open University or Athabasca or one of the mm -hmm. universities, uh, mm -hmm. so how did you go about selecting those courses? And is there anything you're going to change from the content? Or is there anything you need to do to make it more relevant to your teachers as opposed yeah. to, you know, a different audience? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so in the courses, as you can imagine, um, so there are some content that are not relevant to Rwanda. And again, the courses we are developing is not really a big course. So, uh, when you look at all the course content, they may, they may go up to hundreds of pages, like 600 of pages. What we need for the time being is only 50 pages, not more than 50 pages, uh, because the courses we are developing is uh, not more than 40 hours. 
So, and we are uh, creating it using actually three, um, three different uh, courses. So, so we are repeating the one which, has, which is more relevant and the one which uh, makes sense uh, to one and the other. So the one which they will read and feel that it makes sense to them. So we are adding some content as well. So it doesn't mean that we, we also add some uh, some content, but not, not really many. Okay, mm -hmm. we need so I, I, I can see I, I can see Igor's question as well. Maybe we just had dead come to it. Yeah, so my, I think um, they are thinking Igor's was next. So he says you mentioned mm -hmm. the national framework for MOOCs yeah. and OER that is going to be developed. Do you know when the framework this is Igor's like field of work? So he's gonna be talking to you very soon. Do you know when the framework will be finalized besides UNESCO? I mean, we, 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 don't, we don't know yet, and I think, um, I don't know if UNESCO know, knows yet. So uh, what UNESCO is, they kind of contract the consultants. And the consultants come and organize a workshop to consult with different stakeholders, give them ideas to feed in the framework. Um, so um, for the time being, uh, there have been one, one workshop. Uh, we suppose they are working on it, and then and they are on day with corners, uh, you know, different uh, stakeholders for our validation. Um, so uh, there will be some sub questions a little bit. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the way the way we are involved is is just participating in those workshops and, and kind of guiding, uh, guiding the safety text and different uh, kind of practices to have us. Yeah, that's how we are involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to look at so, uh, Gino, Gino's comment and question? So, he says he, there's exploring a module on digital literacy for online yeah. learning, which shares much of the other reality. Um, so he's mm -hmm. wondering about suggestions on how to get them at work mm -hmm. for more open capacity building at the start of such a huge undertaking. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh -huh. that second I'm still processing it. <laughs> mm, okay. Yeah, open capacity building start of such well yeah, but maybe for you know so for, for for us what we have been doing is, is, is actually adapting those courses um from the three uh, courses which we thought uh, are relevant and have relevant content that can help us prepare those learners for uh, successful online learning uh, maybe we can share, we may share experience when uh, those data start uh, taking those courses uh, later on. So I, I'm not sure if you understand how I can answer this question. Ourselves, we are still experimenting it when well, developing those courses. But I, I, I'm saying, I would say we are still developing those courses. Maybe after the course one with the first cohort, uh, we, we can share our experience with the uh, with university. I don't know, uh, maybe uh, they may find uh, some of what we did may, that may be relevant to what they can do in, the, uh, in South Africa. Uh, so uh, I found it really quite difficult to answer this question. It's but uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you know, can clarify. But you see, if I if I can come in for a second, maybe uh, one of the things that that um, would be it might be a good idea is if you start by actually asking your teachers as in what do they think is is actually uh, open educational practice, what do they think uh, doing some something in the open means? Because I'm actually thinking so if we go back to the same idea as in when you ask somebody, you know, do you use mm -hmm. what somebody when you use when you ask a teacher, do you use open educational uh -huh. resources? They they are all going to say no. It's the same thing. You know, do you mm -hmm. are you an open practitioner? No. What are you talking about? 
But if, the, you know, without labeling practice or without labeling a resource, if you get them to think about mm -hmm. what it is that they do, how do they share, how do you know, it might actually, you know, it can, they come to realize that they, they, some of the practices they engage in are, are may, I don't know, maybe already open. Oh, okay. So, what we did, we didn't ask them if they know who we are or not, or how they share. So, what we ask them is actually, we ask them if they uh, they can find resources online. The basic, just finding resources online. Then, then to to make sure if they say yeah, we we do it, to make sure they actually do it. Then we gave them a task of finding resources online and then share a URL and the name of the resources. It's, it's interesting, so we, 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 they are not presented this, given this, are not present part of this presentation, but it's quite interesting to see the disparity between what they said they could do and what they could actually do. If I remember well, around 70% had said that they can do that, but actually around 30% were able to submit something. <laughs> So, uh, and of course, the reason why we asked those questions is we were trying to see what we can include in this course, preparatory course, digital literacy for online learning. So, it's a lot of concern for us because few people were able to do it. We know now we can include in that course and we provide that course uh, before they engage in any blended learning. Yeah, that's, yeah, super. Um, will we go to Deborah's question? Um, uh, she says, what about, sorry, how how do you plan to get leadership involved? Ah, we get into this argument, so we start from the bottom up, open the yeah. up. Now. So how do you get leadership involved? You did mention some kind of a, a network, but is this, uh, as before, but what about a network of education leaders? Or is yeah. that just yes. some teachers? Okay, so for leaders as well, um, I, I think it, the way to answer this question to really kind of uh, highlight how education is stru structured in Rwanda for school. I mean, how education employees, uh, employment sector is structured. At the school level, we have teachers. Uh, then at each school, there's a, a teacher who mentors others, uh, who mentors others, and uh, that is called a school-based mentor. Uh, then there's a director of studies uh, who is in charge of, of saying or study activities, and there's the head teacher who's kind of the, uh, the leader or representative of, of the school. Then uh, in a sector, we have what we call sectors. In the sector, there are like 10 schools. And there's also a, a sector education officer. Um, professional learning networks uh, will be involving uh, school leaders and, and, and the sector education officer, and the sector education officer being like a moderator of those uh, professional learning networks. So, um, and that's the leadership at the school level. And overall, uh, those, those teachers and head teachers they have been attending different uh, teacher capacity building or school leader capacity building uh, courses and programs organized by VVOB. Uh, but again, VVOB is working with the Rwanda Education Board, which is a kind of the teacher management uh, organization uh, across the, in, in the country. So, we are, uh, of course, there's different uh, discussion and exchange between the VVOB. And the uh, director general of one education board, and also the University of One School of Education. So, um, uh, did I answer the question well, uh, Deborah? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. So they are both writing, both Vivian and oh, yeah. are writing like that. Okay, so that's so uh, I can see there's Gino's question. Why use oh yeah? <laughs> but a different reason why that that motivated us to use open rights and resources. Uh, 
from our perspective, on our part, I'm, I'm going to probably to answer this question uh, on our part, the benefit uh, from our perspective as people who are developing the courses. Uh, and also, I will talk about the benefit of uh, beneficial. On our part, we, we chose those courses which were open license because they were there free of charge. So we didn't have to pay anything to access those courses. And out of short, they are. Um, they, are, they are responding to our papers, they are related to our needs, so they are enough to, uh, for us to achieve our objectives. Uh, then the derivative course, uh, there are two reasons why they have to be open and licensed. Uh, when you look at all uh, original courses, uh, their open license have the share alike property, which requires also to uh, share the courses under the same uh, license. But there's another motivation, because courses are hosted at the Water Education Board, Moodle, which is the learning management system, we don't want a Water Education Board to monopolize the content, uh, especially because the Water Education Board expressed interest of hosting those courses on their learning management system so that they can uh, kind of motivate teachers or encourage teachers uh, to keep learning and taking those courses. Uh, even teachers in the, in the district where they will be. Uh, is not is not providing training. Uh, I would like to highlight that Vivo is providing training 17 district out of 30 districts in Rwanda. So uh, there are other teachers who are uh, not uh, targeted by Vivo in different districts. Uh, so uh, one education board wants also to uh, encourage those teachers to uh, to take these courses in the self paced learning mode. Um, well, will we wait if, if guys, if we have any more questions, just type them on the on the chat. But I was I was wondering um, because I think um, you know if in Rwanda you're already talking about um, you know open policies, it's actually a huge step that not many other countries have have you know even considered. Like so, it's not we're not I'm I'm not just not talking about. It's just I'm talking about the whole world, really. So, um, how are you finding? Do you find yourself um, um, kind of open to collaboration? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking you're probably open to collaboration, of course. But how difficult are you finding? Um, do you find yourself quite isolated when it in, when it comes to actually talking about open education, or or are you already having conversations? I know that, for instance, you, yes. could, you have already started a conversation with Gino in South Africa, but Gino, mm -hmm. it, are those conversations happening, basically? Yeah, yeah. So sure, I, I think this started as isolated initiatives, but, but eventually, even the politicians at the national level started to buy in. So, because they found probably some benefits in, in it. At the national level, I mean the government, the government have what they call, uh, uh, how do they call it, is the, uh, I forgot, is uh, Rwanda 2020. It's kind of a development plan. And in that development plan, they had projected that they would be providing, that they are intended to transform Rwanda into a knowledge-based society. And for that to happen, uh, they have to, develop different courses and provide increased accessibility to access to higher education and the quality of education. And then, and of course, I think they saw possibility. As they have been updating that uh, strategic plan, uh, they saw value in this, those open courses uh, because it can help uh, uh, kind of increase access to education to citizens. So it makes sense when you, when you look at what they say they are planning to do and the actual the current access to education, you find really a huge imbalance. Uh, for example, access to higher education is about only five percent. So that, that you cannot you cannot transform a country or a society into a knowledge based society uh, with only five percent of people who have been uh, able to access educa higher education, especially. So uh, that's why they have been buying it, and, and, and now they have started making ambitious, um, ambitious, how would I say, plans. And one of them is the, uh, the, the government plan, implementation plan, 
now the government strategy implementation plan that project is that by 2017 50% of higher education should have been provided through open distance and e-learning and then 30% uh, of secondary education should have been provided through open distance and e-learning and of course that it, it, it didn't happen, so, so it's a plan which was not uh, not implemented and sometimes they issue some criticism, so you have it, why didn't you implement it? And then, um, so they, eventually they tended to see uh, these open courses as a solution uh, for them to be able to implement their plans. So I would say the reason why they, they bought it is they see value in it. And, even I was saying how uh, UNESCO have been supporting in developing the policy implementation strategic plan. Uh, it's actually the Ministry of Education that went to that kind of support. So uh, we can't say that they started buying in and they, are, they have started doing something really to, to make it happen, even though uh, maybe it's, it's just in, in, in terms of trial at the end. That's how I would say. So for the time being, the only, I would say we will be sort of reading in terms of developing those courses. I mean, in terms of practices. Well, I, see, I still think it's, it's absolutely fantastic, you know, that's, because that's not, that's, we all face, well, in one way or another, we all face the same problems, and at least we're starting to draw things. Um, let me see, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Right, we still, if you're happy, we still have another question there. So, uh, there's a very difficult question from Jenny. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, Jenny is talking about measuring your wins. So, have you, have you even considered that? So, how do you, how will it be, what would you consider actually, you know, how would you measure your success? As in, how do you know, have you even thought about it or? Because that's a, that's a difficult question. We're talking even like we go back to future and impact. Yep, that, that's a good question. I think our success would be measured on the numbers of people or on those, uh, you know, kind of participants who have completed those courses successfully. I think that's how we can measure our, our success. For the time being, was two, two, and of course, two which that success is some milestone, which are less complex. We, we aim to achieve uh, kind of every, I would say, uh, every. I think we, we, we organize our reporting on the quarterly report. Every quarter we have what we have a plan to uh, complete. So once we complete it, we can say, yeah, this is it, probably success, which is leading us to achieving the ultimate objective or the ultimate goal. But really, we will, we will start saying we have been successful if those courses are running. And uh, there are really more people who are competing. Statistics will kind of help us measure our success. I think we are all very excited, Jenny. Um, it's it's kind of it's um, I mean all oh, more more you know all these all all guys doing amazing things. Um, there is a you might want to um, touch on Caroline's comment. Um, She's kind of wondering about the potential. Well, she's not wondering. She knows there's a lot of potential for um, this idea of, um, um, you know, reaching different teachers in 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 different countries in Africa. But how? Yeah. It's just it's just go back to this idea of raising awareness. How do you go? How do you find the teachers that really need this this kind of this kind of support and who are then going to oh, okay. and and help their community. Uh -huh. Well, uh, well, we've always been working with one education board, which is managing uh, teachers. Um, I think one education board defines the kind of training teachers need, and, and sometimes it comes from teachers themselves, a uh, kind of uh, um, request you those training from one education board. And then one education board will work with development partners to prepare those kind of training. Um, so, Again, one education board is planning for, for example, this effective school leadership program. Uh, one education board is planning that to require that, that certificate for future school leaders. 
Uh, so which is sort of motivation for them. Um, so if they want to be head teachers, for instance, they may want to take those courses. And if they, they complete, them, complete them, then they are eligible to be uh, school leaders, like head teachers, uh, many head teachers. Um, briefly, because we have a couple of, we still have a few minutes. Um, I, again, we go back to Vivian. Is this idea what goes first, practice or policy? Does practice drive policy or does policy drive practice? I think it's going to depend. Um, you know, again, it's a, it's a very big question. I think it's going to depend very much on, on each particular situation. I mean, it comes to mind yeah, that's what, happens, what happens in Glasgow, for instance. How having like a you know, an open education policy has helped, you know, sell yeah. open to the whole staff in, in Glasgow, Caledonia. So, yeah. I don't know. Uh, not, and it mean. also depends, yeah, it also depends on the culture. I remember when we were developing the uh, methodology for the capacity building, um, I remember the the principle of the College of Education at the University of Rwanda State. You know, we, we couldn't do this because there were no policies. So, <laughs> yeah, policies sort of raise awareness uh, of people and also give them sort of responsibility, uh, feel responsible really to, to do it. That, but that's how in the context of Rwanda fits sometimes away. Because we, we tend to have most uh, predominantly a top down, uh, a top down kind of system. So if you, don't have, if you have a national policy, Institutions are more likely to develop their institutional policies uh, with reference to the national policy. And then we also have what we call performance contracts. Um, they will make sure they implement them because they don't want to look at they have been unable to implement them. And that's that's a big deal here in the world. So some leaders know they are, they are done for that. So if they say they will plan this, then they have to implement it. And of course, from the top level, if they say at the national level it's, it's planned, and they also tend to push people below to implement it. That, that's why we have seen, as I said, the Director General of the One Education Board requesting different organizations to include technology components in their training. So <laughs> it's, it's, that's how it works. But, but I think it goes both, I would say. So I, I think once there's policy, the policy can influence practices. But again, once their practices also, those practices can influence policy and somehow shape uh, the view of policies. That, yeah, I think I, I completely agree with you. Um, one, will we take one last question? Is anybody, if anybody has one last question, I'll give you, I'll give you one second. Okay. Ah. Yes, so, no, maybe. And there's also, there's also uh, something which we mentioned by uh, Vivian about the challenges in the first of face uh, training. So one of the challenges is that they are very expensive. And I think that's one of the motivations why institutions are going to uh, blend it very close to cut down the first of face uh, kind of sessions. So uh, you can imagine when you, you invite, um, let's say, 500 for these, you have to give them, uh, you know, kind of travel allowances and even accommodation. You have to pay for for it, and it's quite a lot of money. Without mentioning really a lot of papers used in printing uh, the booklets. So uh, I think one that's one of the reasons why we uh, and different organizations are thinking about going into the planning. Okay, so I'm gonna bring us to I'm gonna bring this wonderful webinar to an end. But what I'm gonna do, Bernard, what I'm gonna say to you is my question is my question to you is how can we help? If you need help, I think how can we go GN the whole network? I mean maybe not every single one of them, but if you need help <laughs> with anything, just give us a shout because we we are here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So honestly, by all means, I think my, you know, I, my, I echo the sentiment of my, of my colleagues um, and fellow Gojian people. 
was um, mm -hmm. honestly because I mean you're doing amazing work and with you know it's a huge task as Jenny was saying with kind of you know not a lot of woman or manpower so um, if yeah. you need any help you know with anything just just let us let yeah. us know we'll just channel all that towards the whole of the network um, yeah. so again uh, Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Um, you know, I find uh, yeah. these webinars amazing, and the fact that we can actually can I, can I, sure. Can yeah. I, I think that's very important. What you said, uh, I think probably even more close collaboration, collaborating on projects, for example. So this is what we are doing here in Rwanda. Maybe if we have projects that go over different countries, and probably provided by Goji or you know, uh, in collaboration with Goji, and that would be fantastic. So over to you, uh, Bea. By all means, you know, we we will will kick things like very soon, believe me. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's also Stephanie asked if uh, it's okay to share contact details. I don't, I didn't understand that, but yeah, I'm happy if, if she is sharing my contact details. I'm happy with that. And I'll, okay, I'll share your I'll share your contact details, uh, Bernard. But I don't want anyone to actually, um, you know, troll you or anything like that. So I will only share your email address with the people yeah. present here in this in this in this webinar. I mean, you can always follow uh, if you're on Twitter. You can get uh, Bernard. Um, what what's your Twitter? So let me write it. Yeah. Okay. Let me write it. So yeah, you can always follow Bernard on Twitter, catch him on Twitter and DM him on, on Twitter. But I will send you, yeah, there you go, I will send you, do not write your email address here, but I will send you it. I will share your uh, Bernard's email address with um, uh, with, with the people uh, present here. And uh, again, thanks very much. Okay. It's been, it's been so a pleasure. I, 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 yeah, go on. <laughs> It's been a pleasure, Bernard, uh, to see you again after after such a long time that I haven't seen you. And uh, uh, okay, there you go. I was gonna say don't share it, but if you just put it there, you put it there. So okay, uh, thanks. It's I am honestly, it's I I always I'm always very happy to learn from what you're all doing. Uh, uh, so thank you so much for 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 your time and for. For yet another really, really interesting uh, chat and, and presentation. So thanks very much. Uh, for everybody else, guys, we take a break in August. Uh, there will be no webinar next month uh, because we take a bit of a holiday break. Uh, but we'll be back in September. So I'll see you all in September again. Thanks for coming. Um, and I'm stopping the recording right now. <laughs>